Joswiak, but instead she wasn't able to make it, so it will be presented by, guess who, by Jim Head. See you around here. Uh, Formation and evolution of lunar floor fractured craters, insights into lunar magnetic, magmatic processes. Um, I'm going to use my smartphone as a timer, so at the end of 10 minutes, you'll hear a rather unpleasant sound. Got it. Okay. And then after, really, after, look after, to that. after, <laughs> after five, I'll stand up, and that'll be even more unpleasant. Okay. So, ten I, can't, I can't wait to hear this. Ten minutes. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Derek. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, Lauren sends her uh, regards. Uh, Lauren is in a transition period. I can tell you that Lauren is one of the survey PhDs that just recently graduated. She successfully defended her thesis and graduated in June, in late May. And she's on her way to... Um, the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University uh, to begin uh, work with their group. So it's very exciting that her work and her involvement with Survey has led to, um, in fact, a, a good uh, uh, evolution of her career. So we're looking forward to all the things that uh, she will be doing in the near future. So Lauren has been working uh, for the last few years on formation and evolution of lunar floor, floor fractured craters. This is a phenomenon that was discovered many, many years ago when we started getting high-resolution res, high data. Pete Schultz did a landmark study quite a few years ago, I believe it was 1976, uh, in which he um, outlined the characteristics and classification of these features and interpreted them to be, in fact, um, intrusions, shallow intrusions and uplift of the floor of the crater by that process. Uh, Sean Solomon and I looked at both that option and options for viscous relaxation, essentially wavelength-dependent uh, viscous decay of topography and uh, and depending on the thermal gradient and concluded that uh, that you that that also generally supported the uh, the hypothesis that it was a dike intrusion based on the wavelength of the topography and so on uh, what Lauren has been able to do is to relate these to the broader scale of lunar volcanism and study them in detail with this incredible new uh, data that we have for the moon and that revolution we've had in the last 20 years uh, with things like LRO data, GRAIL data, and other types of, of information. So, of course, we saw the distribution of uh, Mari volcanism just previously in the purple area here. This is the global distribution. And, in fact, we see the crypto Mari here. This is the kind of the whole distribution. So we can ask the question, you know, where do, in fact, um, uh, uh, the, the floor fractured craters occur? So Mari, Mari cover, Mari cover, 17% <laughs> of the lunar surface, basically, and then... Cryptomari is determined by uh, Jenny Witten, uh, cover another 1.8%. So extrusive uh, deposits uh, only represent about one-tenth of the melt available based on calculations from several different points of view. So Kirk and Stevenson and Lionel 982 uh, took a look at this, and most of the magma actually gets in place in dikes and not onto the surface. So what you see there is less than 1% of the total volume of the lunar crust, which is not very much, that is the extrusive equivalent, and, and a lot of it is intruded, okay? As I was pointing out previously in dikes that stall in the cross die, heat death, or maybe get to the surface and leave some indication of their presence at shallow depths. So what's the evidence for intrusive magmatism? I talked previously about dikes, dike emplacement events, and the, the fate of those. So we have a, essentially a menu we can look at to try to figure out where those dikes are as they get near the surface, et cetera. Uh, but one of those categories was, of course, the floor fractured craters. And these, in fact, as Lauren uh, outlined in using the much updated data in, uh, in, uh, recently in 2012, uh, did a global map of characterization of these features. And this is the global distribution of these features. You can see they kind of huddle around the Mari. We've never known whether that's a primary effect or simply that there's uh, floor fracture craters that underlie these. Uh, but Lauren, in her analyses, has been able to actually study these in much more detail and get an idea of what's going on. Well, what are the floor fractured craters in detail? Uh, of course, uh, the most important thing is you observe their, you know, geologists were, were very straightforward. You call them the way you see them. It's a crater. Its floor is fractured. Therefore, it's a floor fractured crater. Um, let's not get too uh, creative here. That's, that's fine, okay? So they're anomalously shallow. This was found out, of course, as soon as any kind of uh, photometric data or just simply shadow measurements were made, that they're also anomalously shadow. Uh, there's 170 of them as documented by Lauren in her paper in 2012. Uh, she re-examined the Schultz catalog and all the new data and added to it and, and, and modified it, et cetera. The diameter range is 13 to 208 kilometers. Uh, there's eight morphological uh, subclasses, mostly derived by PEAT, but we updated that uh, as well with the new data. 
And again, these hypotheses that I just mentioned, formation by magmatic intrusion and sill formation, and in both Pete's and, uh, uh, and in uh, Lauren's papers, uh, you'll see the documentation and the evidence for why this is the case. I won't go that, into that at the present time. What she's been doing since then is studying the processes of emplacement and how that uh, uh, can be discerned from the characteristics of the morphology, the morphometry, and models for the evolution. So how do the different flow morphologies of floor fractured, crater, floor morphologies, floor fractured craters reflect the magmatic formation process? How does the distribution of these fit within the lunar volcanic paradigm? So these are important questions. And we have data that can, we can use to test these with. So that's what Lauren's been doing. So there's a wide variation in flora morphology. Um, again, that's the subclasses that you see. But one of the classic differences is, in fact, you get uh, both domed flat floors, uh, domed floors and flat floors. So this is a generally a flat floor. Uh, this is a domed floor. And clearly, flatter floor profiles are observed in craters that have diameters less than 40 kilometers, as you can see here, uh, whereas the dome floor profiles, uh, 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 the, the uplifted flat floor craters are in those increased uh, with diameters greater than 40 kilometers. So that's a fundamental difference there. So the statistics of the distribution of these things really illustrates that these things are in greater than 40 kilometer diameter craters, and the dome ones are in less than 40 kilometer diameter craters. So what's going on? Well, we have sufficient data now to really do detailed topographic and analytical you know, with the LROC data, with the uh, um, essentially the um, uh, LOLA data and so on, we can really do maps and detailed structure. And that's what Lauren has done in a couple of papers that are in review. Um, so uh, this is a map of the contour of the floor at, at 100 meter uh, intervals. So what you see here uh, are uh, the whole range of contours. And we can use this to map out the geological features, the fractures, et cetera, and then look at them as a function of topography, which is assumed to be related to the emplacement process. So we observe extensive fracture systems. You see smooth Mari deposits oftentimes ponded uh, at the lower elevation crater floor edges. And you see quite often uplift of the central crater floor region. And you can see that there are concentric fractures surrounding that, as well as radial ones extending away. And we're modeling how, in fact, these emplacement process create, uh, correlate with the deformation patterns. And the total floor uplift can be um, you know, about one and a half kilometers relative to the edges of the crater floor. So that's, that's just like. The, the floor uplift relative to the edge of the crater floor. So these are the kind of documentation you can get uh, in analyzing these in detail. And then, of course, Lauren has gone in and looked at the fracture types. These are important to designate the type of faulting that's going on, maybe what's related to magmatic uh, intrusion, what's related to tectonic deformation as the whole floor is uplifted, et cetera. And she's analyzed four different types of features. Um, Graben, and these are located along the wall, and they're superposed by the Mari deposits. V fractures are deeper than 100 meters. These are substantial V fractures, and they're pre prevalent in the center. Uh, shallow V fractures less than 100 meters are prevalent in the outer regions of the crater floor. And uh, then the pit chains, these are connected pits, and these are dominate, dominant in the outer regions of the crater floor. So you also observe, oftentimes, uh, depressed vent-like features along some of the V fractures. So this is clearly a relationship of a tectonic deformation and also magmatic uh, evolution. So we see extrusion associated with some of these from the subsurface sill-like formation. Uh, and we also see some venting going on where we see these uh, vent-like structures associated with a V-shaped fracture. So we can put this together uh, into um, uh, 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 kind of like a correlation uh, between these uh, crater types and take a look at um, the two different types, that is the domed and the flat floored. Uh, and so this is an example. This is the crater Alphonsus, as many of you know. Uh, which also has uh, greater than 40 kilometers. It has that floor uplift. It also has a whole series of similar types of fractures as the ones uh, mapped in other large craters. And it also has vents shown here um, around many of these fractures. So these are pyroclastic vents. Um, th this particular crater does not have, uh, Alphonsus does not have, uh, as, uh, uh, does not have any flooded lava like you see here, but rather it's dominated by these pyroclastic vents. And the shallower, uh, sorry, the smaller craters, less than 40 kilometer diameter, really have the almost a broad uh, uplift in the middle. Uh, and you can see the fractures that surround the areas that are uplifted. Um, and the whole floor is not as much uplifted as the central portion is here, both in the initial stages and then later on uh, for those, particularly with the central peaks, where you get a more uh, specific uplift like this. So these can be mapped out into a series of uh, steps in the process of formation interpreted from this collected data. So for example, you have a dike emplacement. The dike stalls at the basically a neutral buoyancy zone in the breccia lens, the low density breccia lens below the crater. 
uh, it uh, continues to grow and then uh, creates uh, and starts to uh, essentially intrude laterally and produces a lacolith. So there's uplift in the central part and then, of course, uh, uh, increased migration uh, away from that uh, uh, in the formation of the sill. The sill grows. This uplifts the central part of the floor to create and craters less than 40 kilometers in diameter that, that central uplift structure there. And then finally it uh, uh, moves laterally and fills and pushes out to the edges of the crater walls and in fact produces then the ultimate morphology and structure of the floor fractured craters. So each of those features that it, I illustrated can be, can be linked to this process here. And there's a fundamental change uh, at the less than 40, greater than 40 kilometer diameter range. Uh, and one of the things that we can see is that the, based on theory as well as observations, uh, it looks like that as the intrusion, the sill extends out across the crater floor, when it gets to the place where the rim crest is uh, encountered, the overburden pressure of the rim crest tends to seal it off and it then starts lifting up in a piston-like manner relative to um, relative to lateral uh, emplacement. So this is a really important part of it. So the transition more uh, form, was that the rude sound? That was the rude sound. Okay, thank you. You gotta work on that one. <laughs> transition in form morphology corresponds to a transition in intrusion morphology uh, from a bell shape uh, that is a, a lacolith um, to uh, a tabular sill like you see here. So that's a really important distinction there related to the, the size. So let's ask the question, floor fracture crater distribution. We come back to this and we say, okay, so what is the relationship here? What can we learn from this in terms of the magmatic emplacement processes? Well, crustal thickness influence on floor fractured craters has been hypothesized in the past. And we can take a look at that here by looking at the distribution of crustal thickness, with red being thickest and uh, uh, purple being thinnest. Uh, and one can see that the distribution of the floor fractured craters is distinctly related to the transition between thin crust, where the mari is, and thick crust, where the highlands are, the thicker highlands deposits. We see a uh, South Pole Acre Basin, but every time you see something in the thicker crust, it's on the floor of one of these large structures uh, like Muscoviense or other basins, uh, Oriental, etc. So there's a very important correlation with crustal thickness. And we, uh, in a paper in uh, Josviak et al. somewhere, uh, 2015, uh, we have the kind of like an attempt to understand that. If we look at this here, this is the uh, lunar surface and the crust. Uh, think about dike overpressurization, where you get a frequency distribution of dike emplacement events based on the, the size distribution of overpressurization events. So we have some which will be low. Uh, overpressurization pressure here is insufficient to get to the surface. Some get close to the surface. Some exceed uh, the ability to get to the surface and pour out onto the surface quite readily. And we think that the overpressurization level three indeed produces dikes and they die a heat death, whereas uh, overpressurization level two, uh, in fact, uh, is just enough to get it to the low density features and uh, crater floor breccia lenses and then intrude laterally as sills and then those that exceed this of course come out in, in shallow crust, uh, thin crust and pour out onto the maria. So we have kind of a family here of options that we can use to look at the distribution and as we look back at this we see that in fact this is uh, the, the ones that exceed it fill the maria here whereas the ones that don't exceed it don't seem to get to the surface and this is very comfortably in the mid-crustal thickness range between these two options and it seems perfectly reasonable that at least many of these could be due to just simply intruding in this level of crust. So this is basically um, the story so far. Uh, floor fractured craters are formed by magmatic intrusion, sill formation beneath the crater. The distribution of the floor fractured craters uh, is well explained by crustal thickness paradigm. There are other factors as well obviously but the general paradigm seems to hold and all floor fractured crater intrusions progress through the same initial stages and then final intrusion morphology is determined by crater diameter, uh, as we saw in those uh, illustrations. Magmatic intrusion hypotheses uh, seem to be able to explain all the observations we've seen thus far. And what Lauren is doing now is using the new GRAIL data. We see, obviously, evidence for emplacement of uh, uh, foams because you're getting pyroclastic deposits. And so we, she has been using the GRAIL data to compare the predicted thickness of the magma solidified with what we observe uh, in the GRAIL data. And it turns out it looks under dense. And that probably means we're getting a lot of foam in the subsurface there. Uh, that is probably what leading to these pyroclastic eruptions. So that paper is in review, quite possibly just accepted. And so this is really interesting because we have evidence to compare the predicted thickness with the observed thickness. And it's telling us that there could be some really underdense material in this, these deposits. So that's an exciting thing for future exploration, uh, and we look forward to uh, pursuing that. Thank you very much.
Rudy in the first one. <laughs> Any comments or questions, please? Okay, maybe I'll uh, um, my brother. Um, it is the crater forming process that actually weakens the crust that enables this magmatism. In principle, it's the creation of a pressure layer. So you, you're actually you're actually fracturing the crust and decreasing its density. Um, and you know they're they're uh, ultimately over time seismic shaking and things that that tend to seal things up, but or, or make them denser. But still, it's pretty much for a long term a location where if a dike came up, it would. Just the right overpressurization level would would sense that low density and spread laterally. It's a it's a micro example of what the overall lunar crust would do in terms of a buoyancy. So you can't look for these outside craters. Pardon? No point looking for these outside craters. Um, we haven't seen any. You know, yeah. we, you could imagine that the floor would be up. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, the question was, uh, do we see these outside of craters? We don't see lots of evidence for bu buoyed up. Uh, uh, zones where you know it intruded in a non-crater environment and, and created radial fractures. Every one of these we see seems to be in a uh, impact crater. Do we have time for that? Yeah. yeah. Um, Scott Hughes, Idaho State. Um, interesting stuff, Jim. Um, is it any possibility that some of the low gravity signatures getting across some of the, uh, the fractures are related to magma withdrawal? It's a good question. So what, what we do is we take uh, the thickness estimate from the topographic variation. So um, if uh, <laughs> uh, foam seems to be the most likely example, magma withdrawal, you, you need some support at that scale to arch up a two, uh, two kilometer thick, 100 kilometer wide feature. So tendency is to think that it, that, that would collapse much more. And you, most of what we see is extension and not, not collapse and contraction. So it's a really good idea. Uh, a little later on today, I'll talk about some of the irregular Mori patches where we think actually that drain back uh, ha has had a major effect. Could I get you to hold it to the discussion? Because we've gone over a little bit. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. No problem.